You're living in a paradise unmatched anywhere else in the world. Go out and take a look. You're watching NQTV. Experiencing difficulties with the sound during this relay program, please bear with us as we try to rectify the problem. Experiencing difficulties with the sound during this relay program, please bear with us as we try to rectify the problem. The town of Carnarvon and the fishing village of Denham, 100 kilometres south, got the worst of the storm. A boiling sea dumped the vessel Korean Star onto the rocky shoreline just after dawn. Nineteen crew members were winched to safety after the high winds ruled out any chance of a helicopter rescue. By nightfall, the fractured hull had begun to tear open as the ship was driven further onto the rocks. The sound of tearing metal was soon followed by the sight of oil bleeding into the ocean. With the ship wrecked, the pollution threat is now being examined by federal and state authorities. The 160 kilometres an hour winds were the furious spin-off from the cyclone which battered the Cocos Islands several days ago. Although there were no injuries, residents complained weather forecasters had issued no warnings. There was no pre-warning. What was it like when it hit? Well, one word for it, absolutely terrifying. It's, uh, it's an experience that no one really wants to go through because it is as terrifying. At Denham, the winds made light work of pleasure craft. 90 boats, including 20 commercial fishing vessels, were seriously damaged. The cleanup is now well underway. Power was restored this afternoon. Dozens of homes lost roofs and windows, but the real cost to the community will be felt in the months to come. The region's fruit and vegetable crops have been virtually wiped out. Paul White, National 9 News. Opposition leader Wayne Goss has demanded the government to again call tenders for the redevelopment of the expo site and this time evaluate them in public. Premier Mike Ahern reportedly has confirmed there'll be no casino in the project, ever. Trade union boss Simon Crean has pledged wage restraint will continue, but in return he's made it clear there must be tax cuts in the second half of next year. As Treasurer Paul Keating applies the finishing touches to Wednesday's economic statement, Simon Crean sent the clearest signal so far that unions will continue to keep the lid on wage demands, but the trade-off, personal tax cuts, must come into operation in the 1989-90 financial year. We would want them early in the following financial year, and we would want a commitment in the May statement that there would be substantial tax cuts in that financial year. 
Mr Keating is expected to do just that later this week when he spells out the details of the mini-budget. The accord between government and unions is in sharp contrast to the brawling within the Labour Party itself over privatisation. An important conference of Labour's left wing today rejected any further consideration of even the possibility of selling off public enterprises. Addressing another party conference in Sydney, Communications Minister Gareth Evans hit back. It seems to me simply too important for the issues to be decided by closed minds on the basis of preconceived or entrenched positions. The left Stuart West was having none of that. I think the opponents of privatisation have virtually won the debate and I don't accept that the issue should be kept alive beyond the conference. That national conference at the ALP in Hobart next month now seems destined to see a lot of fighting over this issue. The right wing of the party is determined to at least set up a committee to investigate privatisation. Peter Harvey, Ken. Ahead in the Sunday Night News, the bizarre background of Chicago primary school killer. And a spectacular takeoff mishap. Plans to redevelop the Gabba as part of a bid for the 1996 Olympics have drawn howls of protest from local residents. The proposal would mean the destruction of one of Brisbane's oldest schools. Under the plans, the East Brisbane State School would be demolished to make way for a lavish sports centre. The Woolongabba Police Station would be replaced by an international standard hotel. Parents and teachers today voiced their concern. They say multicultural education programs established for the largely ethnic enrolment will not be found at other schools. Mainly it will be dis destroying matters of the mind for the sake of the muscle. And that's not a very good way to look upon education, is it? The Gabba Trust is yet to confirm details of the project. Lord Mayor Sally Ann Atkinson says if such a development is planned, it will not be without extensive social and environmental impact study. Narelle Matlin, National 9 News. The bizarre and disturbing background of the woman who opened fire with a handgun in the Chicago primary school has been revealed. And with it, questions of why Laurie Dan was granted a gun licence. Apparently mentally disturbed, she was already well known to police, indeed wanted by the FBI. Parents and children of the Hubbardwood School today return to the scene of yesterday's bloody shooting rampage to grieve and pray together and talk about the tragedy that left one child dead and five others wounded. Well, it's sort of frightening that one of your friends has been killed and gone. Eight-year-old Nicholas Corwin is dead. Five of his friends hospitalized in critical condition. It was here in the affluent Chicago suburb of Winnetka an emotionally disturbed woman with three handguns opened fire on children in a second grade classroom. The suspect, 30-year-old Lori Dan, wounded a sixth person at a nearby home where she barricaded herself for eight hours before police SWAT teams discovered she had taken her own life. I'm shocked at what's happened, but I, I know, I think she was disturbed. So do Winnetka police, who today linked Lori Dan to another crime, leaving sample containers of juice and cookies, both poisoned at the doorsteps of families where she had babysat, and at a school fraternity house, where three young men tried it and are now hospitalized. British military forces are tonight hunting an IRA bomb squad responsible for killing an army dog handler. A landmine planted at the edge of a road close to the Irish border exploded when Corporal Derek Hayes' dog Sam investigated. The blast killed both of them instantly. Five civilians passing by were also injured. Riots in Taiwan today left more than 160 people injured. Police used water cannons to control the crowd of farmers, demanding a ban on U.S. imports. 93 were arrested during the worst violence seen in Taiwan for 40 years. And a lucky escape for more than 200 passengers on board an American Airlines DC-10. The plane skidded off the runway at Dallas Airport after its landing gear collapsed on takeoff. Three crew and two passengers sustained minor injuries in the accident. A new exhibition opens in London this week. A show of paintings and furniture, it rivals any in the world. But that's not surprising. It all comes from the Queen's personal collection. The Queen's art advisors have been scouring Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle for the last two years for this show. They had the pick of thousands of works of art, all owned by the royal family. But the Queen's Gallery off to the side of the palace is small, so eventually only 131 works, most of them priceless, made it into the exhibition. Several works by Rembrandt are here, including this, titled Jan Rixen and His Wife. 
recognized the world over as one of the finest paintings ever done by Rembrandt. Usually these paintings and this furniture grace the private apartments of the royal family. This astronomical clock, designed and built by Christopher Pinchbeck in 1768, normally stands in the grand hallway, leading to Buckingham Palace's garden. The gold centrepiece is still used at banquets for visiting royals. It was made for William IV in 1832, and if sold, would bring over $2 million. The Queen inherited this painting by Bonington. It's one of her favourites. I think she regarded it as a, as a very special personal present and she was immensely pleased to receive it and she placed it at once in her own rooms. The chairs are solid ivory, brought from India in the 18th century. In 1760, the world's finest cabinet maker, William Vile, made this jewel cabinet and only a queen would have enough jewels to fill it. It's all there, the Rubens, Van Dykes, Vermeer and porcelains, centuries old but in magnificent condition as if they were made yesterday. It's a rare opportunity to see works worth a queen's ransom or more. Robert Penfold, National Nine News at Buckingham Palace. From art to sports news now, and what some would say was a woeful performance from the Broncos today, Rob. Very disappointing, Mike. Some sloppy football, as we'll see in a moment. And Dick Johnson takes the flag, but not the race. <laughs> Good evening everyone. The Broncos' worst fears were realised at Lang Park this afternoon when last year's grand finalists, the Canberra Raiders, gave them a real walloping. The Brisbane side was busted wide open in the second half. They lost it 36-16. In other games, Easts upset the Premier's Manly, Cronulla did likewise to Balmain, and Canterbury, who had Steve Folk set off, had a great win over Newcastle. But for local fans, the real upset was at home, where Canberra were just far too strong. Wayne Bennett swung a last-minute surprise when he swung Gene Miles into the second row. And the big fellow was given a pretty hostile reception. For the Raiders, their bonus was a fit Peter Jackson. And in the fifth minute, the State of Origin hero opened up the defence for Gary Belcher. Brisbane were quick to bounce back, but it was obvious Langer and Madison weren't quite used to each other's play. But Gene Miles was starting to feel at home and found a free arm to unload to Michael Hancock. And Hancock's going to score underneath the post. And if you thought Gino's pass was a little forward, watch this one, which gives Daly a clear 50-metre sprint for the line. He's straight through. They won't catch him. Smoke and Joe's coming at him. But Daly's got too much pace. Daly! The Broncos were 10 points out of the game, but with Paco on the boil, the Raiders were running riot. ...was trailing him, and Belcher is going to plant that ball down underneath the post. The chip kick might have worked against the Blues, but on this occasion it gave Chicka Ferguson a chance to stake another claim for State of Origin honours. Scott on Ferguson, he won't get him. Oh, yes. Canberra had dominated the middle and then let their super slick back line finish it off. And maybe the critics who said the Broncos would land in a heap when the ref games were on were being proven right. Oh, that's how simple it is. Well, if I worried about the critics, I wouldn't do the job. They're always critical or something, so that's their opinion. They can have it. Four matches played in the local Winfield Cup. Brothers had a one-point win over Wests. Redcliffe defeated East. The diehards were far too strong for Wynnum. And Ipswich ran out comfortable winners over Logan City. The English rugby union side has kept its unbeaten tour record intact with a Dow victory over Queensland at Ballymore. In a match dominated by the boot, the Englishman hung on to win 22-18. Just five minutes into the match and Queensland were off to an ideal start. Martin under the posts. First try. A Jonathan Webb penalty and a field goal by Rob Andrews saw England level the scores at 6 all. Midway through the first half, the tourists stretched their lead to 12-6 after a pushover try to Jeff Coven. The tackling was ferocious and the hits took their toll. Just before half time, Liner slotted a penalty and the Maroons trailed by just three points. And he does it so easily. In the second half, Webb and Liner were both successful with the boot before Barry Evans gave England some breathing space. Outside is Evans, and it's a try for England. 
Down by seven points with the conversion to come, the Queenslanders sent on a decoy, which ensured the kick was missed. Spoiling the party. A penalty by Webb three minutes from time gave the tourists their second successive victory. Chris Bombalos, National 9 News. English team Nottingham Forest last night showed why they're the masters of indoor soccer, taking out the Super 6 tournament at Boondall. Earlier down 2-1, Forest fought back to beat Manchester City 4-2. With Victoria failing to make the final, Manchester City opened the scoring. Forrest immediately hit back through Tommy Gaynor. Redford in the way, Clough trying to siphon it in, Gaynor does so, did he cross the line? Yes. Hinchcliffe again broke the deadlock and gave City a 2-1 lead. Simpson, Hinchcliffe, 2-1. Just before half-time, Terry Wilson netted with his first touch, 2-all at the break. In the second half, Wilson goaled again to put Forrest in front for the first time. With five minutes remaining, Franz Carr put the icing on the cake. As the Super 6 champions, Nottingham Forest collected $23,000 prize money and an automatic right to defend their title next year. Chris Bombalos, National 9 News. In the National Soccer League, Brisbane Lions and Sydney Olympic fought out a one-all draw. In the 4X Soccer League, Coal Stars down east, Brisbane City denied Redlands a 70th birthday celebration. North Star thrashed Grange Thistle. Rochdale scraped home in the Battle of the Rovers. And Mount Cravat and Ipswich played a one-all draw. Hawthorne today proved the West Coast Eagles are beatable on their home turf. The Hawks ran riot in Perth today to crush the Eagles by 53 points. In the other match, St Kilda stormed home in the second half to upset Geelong by a goal. On the local front, a couple of shock results in the state championships. Southport beaten by the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast eliminated Morningside. In other games, Cooparoo dispatched Western Districts and Maine completely outclassed the Darling Downs. Receiving painkillers for a foot injury, world champion Wayne Gardner still grabbed pole position for tonight's Italian 500cc motorcycle Grand Prix in Imola. With his Honda finally in top shape, Gardner was able to snare the number one spot from Didier de Rodigas and Christian Saron. Kevin McGee qualified seventh fastest. A 60-second penalty for jumping the start cost Dick Johnson victory in the sixth round of the Australian Touring Car Championship at Lakeside this afternoon. After driving a fantastic race, Johnson made up much of the leeway to finish second behind fellow Queenslander Tony Longhurst with Alan Moffat third. Touring car leader Dick Johnson started from pole position, as he's done for all six races. But this time he was just a little too quick. We got a new sort of clutch in, and it picked up on the line, and the car started creeping, and now I'm driving without a clutch virtually. With officials hitting Johnson with a 60-second penalty, Tony Longhurst became the new leader. John Smith was setting Lakeside light, but unfortunately not on the track. They're uh, not only on land here watching the racing today, even out on the lake. Johnson's teammate, John Bauer, was looking good until trouble struck midway through the race. Colin Bond followed minutes later. Johnson knew he had time to make up and began to drive accordingly. Longhurst was pulling out all the stops, lapping the third-placed Alan Moffat. In car number three. Johnson took the chequered flag 16 seconds in front of Longhurst, but knew he was about to be deducted 60 seconds. But despite this, he still appeared to be in a good mood, and he says he won't appeal. Peter Adamson, National 9 News. Now, there's no doubt about it, it's pretty hard to keep him down. Ian Botham has dismissed reports his cricket career may be finished. And that's despite a serious back injury. Botham's spinal injury has been brought on by his last eight years in first-class cricket. The English all-rounder has been forced to wear a plastic cast to support his lower back. Two discs have slipped a centimetre, placing undue pressure on surrounding nerves. While reports say Botham will never play international cricket again, he hasn't given up on representing England next season. Well, I've seen the papers this morning. Um, most of them, you know, end of career, and they talk to these so-called specialists who say he'll never be the same player, and he'll never do this, and he'll never do that. And then I see people blaming the walk for it. It's uh, really rather pathetic, isn't it? And England are coping just fine without the great all-rounder, wrapping up the one-day international series against the West Indies 2-0 at Headingley. After losing the toss, England's top-order batsman failed to lay a solid foundation. It took a quick 39 from big Derek Pringle to carry their total to 187. A modest score, but one which proved enough. 
Then Pringle produced another fine performance, on this occasion with the ball. It was a bit too much for the English crowd. The West Indians bundled out for a meagre 139. Jim Wilson, National 9 News. And unlike the Broncos, the Bullets gave Canberra a hiding at last night's NBL clash at the Palace. The Brisbane boys led at every break to post a 16-point winning margin. Following their heart-stopping two-point win over Illawarra in the snake pit on Friday night, the Bullets had a little more breathing space against the Canberra Cannons. The NBL champions gave the Cannons a real caning, and by half-time the Bullets had blasted away to a 21-point lead. With the heat off, the Cannons had a better final quarter, but in the end it was a pushover at the Palace for the Brisbane Bullets. The Adelaide 36ers are still on top of the ladder, but the defending champions are displaying the firepower that could see them once again go all the way. For our sport tonight, folks, and now it's back to Heather. Thanks, Rob. Tonight's pools results, the winning numbers are 9, 11, 21, 26, 33, 38. The supplementary is 24. And after the break, full weather details. At a super walk for a good cause. Another idyllic day around Brisbane. Cool overnight though with 10 degrees. The top today was 22. Plenty more sunshine on the way too for tomorrow with warmer northwesterly winds. At the moment the barometer is on 1,012 millibars and rising. Humidity is 63%. Current temperature is 17. That's too below. On the synoptic chart, the low over the Tasman Sea is moving slowly to the southeast. A cold front over central and south Australia expected to move rapidly eastward. And there's a high over central Queensland. The satellite photo shows an upper level trough extending from Western Australia into South Australia with rain ahead of a prefrontal trough. A cold front is following that trough into the Western Bight. Forecast for capital cities, rain and scattered showers for most. Sydney early rain, the same for Canberra, Melbourne and Hobart. Adelaide windy and fine for Darwin. Northern centres of Queensland, fine everywhere tomorrow. Mount Isa the warmest with 30 degrees, Mackay the coolest with 24. In South East Queensland, the Golden Sunshine Coasts, Dry with light southwesterly winds overnight and freshening tomorrow. Ipswich, Toowoomba and Gympie all fine and dry. On Moreton Bay, winds tending northwesterly and freshening to 15 to 20 knots. The higher seas to 1.4 metres. Look at the tide times. First high at 2.08 a.m. First low at 2.58 p.m. Sunrise at 6.25. Sunset 5.04. Look at Brisbane's forecast. A fine and dry day with warmer northwesterly winds and with a temperature range between 9 and 25 degrees. And looking ahead, fine with cool nights. That's the weather news. Mike. Thanks, Heather. I'll have to get my electric blanket out. Just repeating, scientific tests are continuing to try to identify a body found at Strathpine today. Police fear it's that of missing schoolboy Justin Summers. And the Broncos have slipped down the league ladder after being humbled by the Canberra Raiders at Lang Park today. A statewide charity walkathon today attracted support from an unusual quarter. Prisoners at Boggo Road Jail joined with Waters and Corrective Services Minister Russell Cooper for a marathon trek around the exercise yard. The jail's rock band lent their support for the 10-kilometre walk. At New Farm Park, 3,000 turned out. Some came in wheelchairs, others marched on all fours. Organisers hope this year's Superwalk will raise $300,000 for spastic children. And that's our news for the Sunday. Hope you had a good weekend from the National 9 News team. Take care. Good night.